So uh, we are, as, uh, as we mentioned also last time in uh, this set of lectures, we are going really under the hood of uh, JS applications, trying to understand what is really inside uh, all these programs that work uh, with JS. How do we do uh, certain things uh, in uh, JS software? What data formats we use? And uh, last time in the, uh, this introductory lecture, we looked at two big questions in JS. One is the location question, understanding where the you know, two segments intersect or whether a certain point P is to the left or right of a segment AB. And uh, we will need a lot of linear algebra. Well, not a lot of, but some linear algebra uh, on that. And uh, this is what we will be doing today. I will give like a quick introduction to the necessary, to the necessary linear algebra. And uh, uh, the other question that we looked at is, uh, yes, understanding who is the closest uh, to which site uh, and using particular Voronoi, Voronoi diagrams uh, for that. So that's what we were doing uh, last time. And uh, this part is essentially done. We no longer return into the Voronoi diagram and go into other questions today. So now we are doing this linear, well, linear algebra, but in particular with applications to point location. And uh, of course, linear algebra is, uh, uh, looks like I stopped sharing my screen. Is that true? I'll restart screen sharing. Okay. Yes, hopefully it's there now. So I'm on, uh, well, slide four. Uh, in the yes, in, in our set of slides. Uh, so hopefully you're able to follow also uh, with that. Uh, so uh, before we go to the linear uh, algebra, uh, which is one of the most basic math subjects, uh, let's look at the most basic and most important notions in all of mathematics. Uh, what are they? Well, uh, those of you who have taken other courses with me, you might have seen my definition of the most important and most basic notion in math. That's the notion of a set. Uh, it's not uh, definable. That's why it's so basic. So we're saying that a set you know, is just a collection, a bunch, of, well, a set of things, uh, elements of the set. What's important is understanding uh, which elements belong to the set and which elements do not. And uh, given two sets, X and Y, we can form the set of all possible pairs where small X is in the set large X and small Y is in the set uh, large Y. And that set, the set of all pairs is called the Cartesian product. And in particular, uh, the notion of the function, which is uh, another very important uh, fundamental notion in the math, uh, is, uh, well, it's a mapping from X to Y. Uh, it can be understood as a subset of the Cartesian product, X times Y. So here we have the Cartesian product, and here is this curve, which shows you the graph of the function. You can think of the graph of the function as uh, of a subset of the Cartesian product of uh, X and Y. Uh, for a second. So, uh, Yes, we were talking about the Cartesian product of two sets. One of the most important Cartesian products that uh, you may encounter in, in mathematics is uh, uh, the Euclidean plane, the R squared, or sometimes we will call it just R2. So uh, yes, that's a product of <laughs> real line times the real line, or in the other words, it's the set of two dimensional vectors like this, okay, so set of pairs of numbers of points in the plane. Uh, you can also use polar coordinates. Uh, you can also say that they're complex numbers. So there are lots and lots of ways in which uh, the, the same object, the R2, uh, under, under which the same object is known. So anyway, uh, the product of uh, the real line and itself, the set of pairs of numbers of vectors and uh, so on. That's the R2 or R squared with which we will be working. And uh, similarly, you can define Rn. Uh, it's an n-fold product of real line set of all n tuples of real numbers of vectors of length n and so on. So few conventions uh, or notations that uh, we will be using in this course. 
So uh, any point in the two-dimensional plane has two coordinates or any vector has two components, px and py. Sometimes we will be denoting them as p1 and p2, or using this MATLAB style, p1 and p2. So if p is a vector or a matrix uh, with two entries, then the first entry is denoted as p of one, the second entry is denoted p of two. So that's very much like MATLAB style. Uh, it's pretty convenient. And then if you ever need to implement things in MATLAB, then it's kind of directly, you can take it from the lectures. So by default, the vectors will be column vectors. So the vectors can be row vectors like one, two, or they can be column vectors like one, two. And by default, a vector is a column vector like this. So to go between the column vectors and row vectors, we use the transposition. So if we have a row vector and apply the transposition operator to it, uh, it becomes a column vector. So you have vector like this, one, two. At this point, I might have wanted to start using Jamboard, but I'll skip it. So if you transpose this, then the vector becomes a column vector and uh, vice versa. So if you do the transposition of a column vector, you get a row vector. And again, using MATLAB notation, uh, we will use just the apostrophe to uh, denote the transposition. That's how MATLAB denotes, denotes transposition. Now again, uh, with the conventions as in MATLAB, if you want to list the elements of uh, a row vector, you can just use spaces between the elements. So you can use commas or commas and spaces, that doesn't matter. So all these things uh, mean the same thing, the row vector one, two. Uh, the semicolon is uh, in MATLAB uh, denotes the new row. In particular, if you have a column vector like this, so one, two is a row vector, you have the transposition. So this is really a column vector. Another way to specify the column vector is specify it like this, one semicolon two. So it's like one, and then you start new row because of the semicolon, and then you have two. So this is another way to specify the column vector. Again, this is pretty standard in uh, MATLAB. You can get used to it also during this course. And while the transposition is its own inverse, so the transpose of the transpose is the original vector, right? So if you have this column vector and apply the transposition to it, then you get a row vector like that. Let's just play with uh, changing columns and rows back and forth. Standard thing in linear algebra and also in MATLAB, and well, we will be using this uh, notation. Okay, some properties of uh, the Euclidean plane of uh, R square or R2. It's a vector space, uh, so you can add uh, its elements and you can multiply them by numbers. So if you have two vectors P and Q, then the sum of them is taken component wise. The first component of the sum is the sum of the first components, the second component of the sum is the sum of the second components, and you can multiply vectors by a number. Again, you multi do the multiplication component wise. It's easier to see than me trying to read what this really means. So uh, the dimension of R2 is two. Uh, the maximum number of linearly independent vectors is two. In particular, here are the two linearly independent vectors, uh, which are called the standard basis for R2. Any two linearly independent vectors form a basis, but uh, these are called the standard uh, basic vectors or standard basis, one, zero, and zero, one. And uh, any vector can be written as the sum of its first coordinate times E1 times this vector, plus its second coordinate times E2 times the second vector. And I'll try again to scribble here something with my mouse, but maybe I will go to Jamboard uh, sooner. So uh, yes, if you have a vector of, I don't know, like three, two, then the first coordinate of the vector is three, and you can multiply it by the first basic vector, zero, one, and add to it the second component of the vector and multiply it by the second basic vector and well three times one is three mm -hmm. three times zero is zero and two times zero is zero two times one is two 
So you can verify that this holds well, in this example, but also it holds uh, in general. So uh, the uh, R2 can be turned um, into uh, an Euclidean space. Euclidean space is a space uh, with uh, a scalar product. So you can define the scalar product of uh, two vectors as the product of the first two components plus the product of the second two components. And this is the same as the absolute value of the first vector times the absolute value of the second vector uh, times the cosine of the angle between them. So, well, let me still continue here. If you have two vectors like three, two, and I don't know, maybe one, two, then the scalar product of these two, if you multiply one by another, what you do, well, you multiply in the first components and you multiply in the second components and then you sum those two things. That's uh, your answer. That's the scalar product. Scalar product is a number and this is how it's obtained. Okay. And uh, we will be denoting scalar product, well, maybe like this. You can, you can see the notation like this maybe like this, just by having the multiplication sign between the two vectors or just omitting any multiplication sign, uh, just like that. And similarly, you can define the uh, scalar product for vectors of higher dimensions, uh, three and n. Again, you multiply the corresponding components and you take the sum of uh, what you have obtained. Okay, so that's the scalar product. Again, I'm hoping that uh, you're not seeing it for the first time, but if you do, well, that's uh, what it is. Next thing is matrices. So vectors are kind of rows or columns of uh, numbers. And uh, well, matrices are the whole tables of numbers <clears throat> with the multiple rows and multiple columns. So here is an example, it has three rows, three columns. And uh, the element in row I and column J uh, will be denoted like this, AIJ or often using again MATLAB style, we will be referring to it like this, A of IJ. So again, here is the matrix and the matrix has three rows. So we can write this matrix in a single line by just listing the three rows and separating them with the semicolons. Remember the semicolon is the sign for new line. So it's this row, then new line, this row, new line, this row. So these are really the same things. This is just, I don't know if it's easier. It's a single uh, row, but I think this one here on the left is kind of, it's more easy to see what this matrix is. Uh, so yes, it has uh, three rows, three columns. And if you take, I know, the element in the second row and the third column, A to three, well, that element is six. Here we go. Uh, so matrices of same size, if you take, I don't know, three by three or two by two matrices, they also, form a vector space. You can add two matrices, add them component wise. You can multiply them by numbers, again, uh, element by uh, element. Uh, vectors are special cases of the matrices. So a column vector is a matrix with, a know, with M rows and one column. And similarly, a row matrix is a matrix with, well, one row and some number of columns, M. So both of these are matrices. So we're talking about the transposition operation of uh, transforming row vectors into column vectors uh, that uh, generalizes to transposing matrices. Again, if you take a matrix and you take its transpose, then you turn the rows of the matrix into columns. So if we take again this matrix A, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, and uh, take its transpose, then we will get the matrix in which the rows of A become the columns of A transpose. So the first row of A is one to three, that becomes the first column of A transpose. The second row of A is four, five, six, that becomes the second column of A transpose. And the third row of A becomes the third row of A transpose. Again, I apologize for my scribbling, but hopefully you understand what it is for something more important, I'll go to Jamboard. So here is A transpose. The first row is one, four, seven, followed by row two, five, eight, followed by row three, six, nine. Okay, so when you transpose uh, the rows and columns, you 
change uh, rows to columns, columns to rows. Now in MATLAB, there is a neat way to refer to the you know, certain row or column of a matrix. So notation like this means the ith row of the matrix. So, okay, I have an example down below, so I'm not gonna draw it. So for instance, over here, this notation means the second row of A. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, this notation. This means the first row of A. Well, here it is, one, two, three. And similarly, notation like this, column, comma, number, like this. This means the second column of A. And the second column of A is 258. It's a column vector. So here it is, 258 transpose. Okay. And in general, if B is equal to A transpose, then the ith column of, J, of, of B is equal to ith row of A. Okay, so again, maybe if you see it for the first time, it uh, may seem uh, like quite a lot of material, but hopefully you've seen it. If not, you can play with it in MATLAB and learn elsewhere. Uh, okay, uh, I guess last uh, but not least thing, matrix multiplication. Uh, if you have two matrices, and uh, the number of rows in one of them is equal to the number of columns in the other. So the dimensions have to match. Uh, well, the number of columns in A should be equal to the number of rows in B. Then you can form the product of the two matrices, A and B, and the element IJ in uh, the product is equal to the product of ith row of A and J column of B. And this product is really the scalar product. So again, if you have A and you multiply it by B, then when you take the ith row of A and J column of B, so the scalar product of these two things, note that they will have the same number of elements, the number of columns in A is equal to the number of rows in B, both of them are P. So these are uh, vectors of the same length or vectors with the same number of elements. You can form the scalar product and that scalar product will be the entry I, J in the matrix C, where C is the product of A and B. Okay, that's matrix multiplication. Uh, diagonal matrix, so a matrix which has zeros everywhere except the diagonal, so zero and zero. Uh, it's denoted like this, diagonal A, B. The first element in the first row is A, the second element in the second row is B, everything else are zeros. Uh, identity matrix is the matrix that has ones on the diagonal, like this, one, zero, zero, one. That's the identity matrix. It's called the identity matrix because you can multiply any matrix by the identity matrix from one or the other side and the matrix will not change. So it's like one in numbers. And uh, moreover, it has a square matrix and uh, you can find the matrix such that when you multiply this matrix by A, you get the identity matrix, then B is called the inverse of A and A is invertible. Okay, so it's like one divided by A. So that's the inverse of a matrix. The inverse of a matrix is a matrix such that when you multiply the matrix by it, you get the identity matrix. Okay, so A inverse times A is equal to the identity matrix. Uh, okay, some properties of matrix multiplication. So uh, if you take a matrix and multiply it by a vector, it's like multiplying the first column of the matrix by the first element of the vector and multiplying the second column of the matrix by the second uh, element of the vector and taking the sum. So let me have uh, an example. Try to clear things now. Uh, I guess I'll go now to Jamboard because uh, there is quite a lot of things that I would need to. It's a third page. Okay. 
So uh, we are now looking at uh, this property of matrix multiplication that if you multiply a matrix by a vector, then it's the same as multiplying the first column of the matrix by the first element of the vector plus the second column of the matrix times the second uh, element of the vector. And we are talking about two by two matrices now, so we only have this, you know, two columns and uh, in the vectors we have two elements. So for an example, uh, I don't know, let's take an arbitrary matrix, one, two, three, four, and multiply it by another vector, by, by a vector or by another matrix, five, six. So what will be the answer? Well, what do we have here as the first element in this matrix? We have the product of this row and this column. So it's one times five plus two times six. What do we have over here? We have the product of this row and again, this column. Remember, when, we, when C is equal to the product of two matrices, then Cij is the product of ith row of A and jth column of B. Okay, so for instance, over here is the element in the second row and first column of this vector and it's obtained by taking the second row of this matrix and first and only column of this matrix and taking their product, scalar product, which is three times five plus four times six. Okay, whatever those are, you know, so this is uh, five plus 12, this is 17. And this is 15 plus 24, 39, hopefully correct. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's doing this product by, by definition. So if you do by definition, this is what we obtain. And now let's do the same product, but uh, using this property. Okay, and the claim is that the result should be the product of the first entry of the vector times the first column of A first column of A, here it is, plus the second entry of the vector, or the second coordinate of the vector, times the second column of A. Here is the second column, two, four. And if we do that, well, five times one, three is five, 15. Six times two, four is 12, 24. And I guess when you sum these up, you should get the same answer. Five plus 12 is 17, 15 plus 24 is 39. And not only that there is any magic that you got the same numbers, but also you can see that you're really doing the same things. So in order to obtain this entry, you multiply in this vector by this row. Well, how do you do that? You multiply the first element of this vector by the elements of this row. And this is what you do both here and here. You take the sum of what you got. So it's the same thing. So in general, uh, the, multi, uh, the matrix multiplication acts column-wise on the second matrix and row-wise on the first matrix. So well, if you really need a shorthand for that, if you have a matrix A and you multiply it by a concatenation of matrices B and C, then it's the same as multiplying A by B and then multiplying A by C and concatenating the two products. And similarly, if you have matrix A and below it, you have matrix B, see there are semicolons, so meaning you're putting them one on top of the other and multiplying it by a common matrix C, then it's like you're multi multiplying A by C. There are questions for somebody? Or I think yeah, I think uh, yes, yeah, so we continue. So if you have two matrices, one on top of another, and you're multiplying them uh, by C, then you can multiply the first matrix by C, then the second matrix by C, and put one product on top of the other. So that's matrix multiplication. There are also some properties of matrix addition. Uh, a plus B is equal to B plus A, although the product in general is not commutative. 
You have the distribution law, just like with numbers. You have the associative law, just uh, as with numbers. So it's interesting that if you multiply two matrices and they take, take the transpose, it's like taking the transposes and multiplying them. Uh, I think it should be in the opposite direction. I might have made a mistake here. It should be B prime times A prime. I'll uh, correct that. Uh, we will not uh, check that, but I'll, I'll make the correction. And the inverse of A, if you transpose that, uh, is the same as taking the inverse of uh, the trans uh, transpose of the matrix. Okay, so again, we will not verify these properties, but well, here are all the properties that you need to know. Well, maybe even more that you need to know for this course, but in general, it's uh, good to know them. Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue. Those were the basic things or some of the properties of matrix multiplication. Uh, determinant. Uh, you can define something called the determinant for a two by two matrix, A, B, C, D. The determinant is, uh, well, this number. So how does it look like? It's probably easier to see when you have the matrix in the stable form. So I'll go to the next uh, page in uh, the Jamboard uh, to write the determinant of the matrix. So the determinant of the matrix A, B, C, D is this number A, D minus B, C. So you take the product of these entries and you subtract the product of these entries. So I go like crisscross. So for a two by two matrix, this is what the determinant is. And uh, geometrically, what determinant means is, uh, is the area of the parallelogram built on the vectors. So if you have the vector A, B over here, the red vector, and you have the vector C, D over here, the blue vector, then the determinant is equal to the area of this parallelogram. So you take the sum of the vectors, or you put the two vectors like this, and uh, you can see that the area of this parallelogram is exactly equal to AB, AD minus BC. So again, let's uh, see why it is so. So you have the vectors. So this vector is A, B, and this other vector is C, this is C, D. Then you can take the area of this full rectangle, which is A plus C times B plus D, and subtract the areas of this triangle, this triangle, and this rectangle, and do it twice because you do it here and also do it on top. And uh, you'll see that this will be exactly equal to the area of the parallelogram, area of this parallelogram. Now, if you have the situation like this, when in order to go from the vector AB to the vector CD, you have to rotate clockwise, then again, the determinant will be equal to the area of the parallelogram, but with the negative sign. So the determinant is really the signed area of this parallelogram, built in vectors A, B, and C, D. And the reason why this is important, now we're finally coming to applications in GIS, it uh, lets you determine whether a point is on one or another side of a line. So remember our question where, one of the GIS questions from map overlay, we wanted to understand whether two segments, PQ and AB, intersect. And one thing we would need to know for that is whether the point P lies to the left or to the right of the line from A to B. And uh, how can you determine that? Well, you can form something that's called vector product. In general, it is defined for vectors in uh, three dimensions. But for vectors in 2D, we can say that the vector product of two vectors is just the determinant like this. And we know that the determinant 
is positive or negative, so from here, we know that the determinant is the signed area of this parallelogram. And in particular, if you look at the sign of the determinant, whether it is positive or negative, you can determine whether you have to rotate to the left or to the right when you go from the first vector to the second vector. So over here on the left, you're rotating counterclockwise from red to blue vector. Here you're rotating clockwise from red to blue. And depending on that, the determinant or equivalently the vector product uh, will have either positive or negative sign because it will be plus the arrow of the parallelogram or minus the arrow of the parallelogram. And in particular, coming back to the question of segment intersection, in order to understand whether a point P lies left or right of the line AB, you form two vectors. One of them is the vector AB and the other one going from A to P. And you take the determinant of these two vectors or the vector product of these two vectors, this vector AP and vector AB. And uh, if you have to rotate clockwise from this vector to the vector AB, then the determinant will be negative. And if you rotate counterclockwise, like here from AQ to AB, then the determinant will be positive. Okay, like this. That, that meant not to be minus, that meant to be underscoring. And uh, understanding whether different, on which sides of uh, one segment, the endpoints of the other segment lies, uh, you can get whether the two segments intersect using the vector product and the vector product you can do using the determinant. Okay, so long story uh, with the determinants, uh, matrix and other things, uh, and short answer to the question of where, whether one uh, point lies, whether a point lies on the left or the right of, uh, of a line. Okay, so uh, that was the answer to one of the questions. Another reason why you may want to use the uh, vector product and uh, the determinants is to determine the areas of polygons. So again, it's a, well, quite a natural GIS question. You are given a polygon like this. So here is the polygon, this whole line. Uh, the black line defines the polygon and you want to know the area of the polygon. How do you calculate the area of the polygon? Well, there are many ways to do it, but one of the simplest ways is to choose the origin arbitrarily. So take some point O as your origin and then go through the edges of the polygon one by one. So here is one of the edges, here is another edge, here is another edge and so on. Well, here is yet another edge. So you go through all the edges. And uh, when you go from the i vertex of the polygon to vertex i plus one, then it may happen that you rotate the vector from the origin clockwise, right? To get from this vector to this vector, you have to rotate clockwise. Or it could be that in order to get from this vector to this vector, you have to rotate counterclockwise, right? And you can observe that the area of the polygon is equal to the total area of triangles like this, like the red one, when you have to rotate clockwise to go from one point to the next. So this is one uh, triangle. Well, here would be another triangle like this. So if you look at this edge. So all these triangles, uh, well, you can take the sum of the areas and they will give you the polygon area, but they will also calculate extra area like this. And you don't want to have this area in your polygon because it's outside of the polygon. So what you would have to do, you would have to subtract from all the area of red triangles, the areas of blue triangles like this. So this should be subtracted the area of this triangle should be subtracted and so on. And the nice thing is that the red triangles differ from blue triangles 
exactly in the way in which the vector from O rotates, right? As we started from observing here from O V I to O V I plus one, you rotate clockwise. Here from O V I to O V I plus one, you rotate counterclockwise. So if you take the vector product of these two vectors, then you will be adding the areas of triangles like this, and you will be subtracting the areas of the triangles like this, exactly as you need for the computation of the area of the polygon. Right, so going back uh, to the previous slide with the parallelograms or with, with vector products, so the vector product is, remember, positive or negative, depending on whether you rotate clockwise or counterclockwise from one vector to the other. And that's exactly what you are using in uh, here in calculating the errors. You're adding these errors and you're subtracting these errors. And both addition and subtraction can be written just as uh, the vector product just as the determinant. And you have a one half over here because really the determinant as we know is the area of the parallelogram which would be built on these vectors. If I move this vector over here and if I move this vector over here, but the area of the triangle is half of the area of the parallelogram. So that's why you're multiplying it but by one half. So this vector product gives you a really simple way uh, vector product and determinants give you a simple way to calculate the area of an arbitrary polygon. You don't have to triangulate the polygon. I mean, there are other ways to calculate the area. You can, you know, split it into triangles and then calculate the area of every triangle separately. But uh, triangulation is, well, quite complicated. And then you would have to calculate all the areas of the triangles. Instead, you just choose the origin arbitrarily. It doesn't matter where this point is, inside polygon or outside polygon, and just do this simple summation for all the edges of the polygon, you calculate in this simple vector product, which is the same as calculating a determinant and uh, adding up, uh, you get the area of the polygon. So speaking of the uh, ways to represent data in uh, GIS, uh, yes, you can, the data can be represented like this, kind of in a continuous manner. The vertices of this polygon can be anywhere. An alternative way, an alternative data format for uh, GIS is uh, having the vertices uh, or more or polygons and everything else on the grid. So you have a grid and the vertices of the polygon must stay on the grid. And it's interesting that if you have such a polygon whose vertices are on the grid, then you can calculate this area differently. You can, uh, its area differently. You can uh, calculate the number of points inside the polygon uh, plus half of the number of points on the boundary of the polygon, subtract one, and that will give you the area of the polygon. So this is known as Pick's formula. We're not gonna prove it, but uh, just for information, that's uh, how you can calculate the area of a polygon with vertices on the grid. Okay, so let's see, we have three minutes remaining. Uh, let's, yeah, let, let, let me just finish, I guess, this hour uh, by again repeating that well by this time repeating but also uh, stating it more clearly that uh, in GIS uh, there are two types of the data or there are two ways in which the data may be represented uh, one is uh, the so-called vector format and the other is so-called raster format or grid format so uh, uh, the data types could be a point so a point could have coordinates and these coordinates can be uh, arbitrary numbers, X and Y. And yes, they are just numbers in R2. Well, each of them is a number. Uh, you can have lines again with vertices at uh, arbitrary points. You can have polygons with vertices in, in uh, arbitrary points and so on. So in particular, uh, with this uh, data format, you can represent not only two-dimensional objects, but also three-dimensional objects by meshes or terrains. And uh, one way to represent terrain is, I'm now starting to draw in the 
Jamboard is to take your region of interest, which may be this square, take some triangulation of it, trying to draw triangles that split this region of interest or the partition, the region of interest. And then for every vertex in this triangulation to specify the height of the terrain. And you will get uh, something which well, may look like this. So you know the heights at all these points and then you just do the linear interpolation between the points. And uh, that's a very precise way to uh, specify the data. It's kind of compact, uh, but it's pretty hard to do computations with this data. And an alternative way to represent data is this raster data. For terrains, this is something called the digital elevation map. Uh, it, while it may be more relevant for, you know, for urban environments, uh, where you really have sharp um, edges and steep uh, slopes, uh, and uh, digital elevation map just takes a grid and specifies the elevation of the terrain at, uh, every, grid, uh, at every grid point. So there is no interpolation. Like here, you don't need these triangles. You just have the uh, height of the terrain at every point. Okay, so those are the examples of uh, GIS uh, data type, I guess, or the resume recording. Uh, so yes, we have two different uh, types, uh, data types in, in particular in GIS, uh, the vector with full precision and raster when uh, you're confined uh, to the grid. And of course, one important question is how do you go between the uh, two uh, kinds of uh, data types? Uh, so if you have a vector data, like over here, you have this red, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, the road, the river, and uh, you want to represent this red polyline uh, with, uh, you know, with, with some pixels, with some pixelated data to convert it to raster. Well, you can just uh, look at the pixels through which this line goes. It goes through this pixel, this, this, and so on and uh, hit those pixels. So you will say, well, my line is represented by these blue pixels over here. And of course, uh, that's not necessarily a very good representation because, well, this uh, red thing is a linear feature. It's uh, a road or a river. And uh, yeah, these blue pixels that uh, represent this red line in uh, the raster format, uh, well, they are not even forming a line or the centers are not forming a line. So you do have some uh, loss of precision. And then there is also a question between, well, whether you represent it really by the pixels or by the centers of the pixels. So maybe only the centers of these pixels uh, represent uh, uh, your line. Uh, there's also a difference between uh, snapping only the endpoints of uh, the line versus uh, well, snapping the whole segment or the whole uh, road, uh, in particular here. Now I'll try to change the color. Of, uh, um, anyway, so that's uh, uh, how you can change uh, the vector data to raster data by just looking at the pixels through which the line goes. And on the next slide, we will have a specific example of how it can be done. So changing the raster format uh, to vector is a more complicated thing. So, well, you can have uh, like here on the picture, all these blue pixels that represent, well, your red segment. And uh, the question is really, how do you fit the best red segment into these blue pixels? Do you fit one segment or do you fit several segments? And if you fit several segments, which segments will you fit into which subsets of the data? Maybe you will fit one segment into this part, another segment into this part, and then, well, maybe these parts should be overlapping. So uh, there is no unique answer of how you would uh, represent different sets of pixels with uh, lines. But if you do know which uh, pixels you want to represent with a line, uh, then uh, you can do a least square fit or things like that. And uh, we will look at, uh, at uh, examples at the next slide. Of course, uh, what uh, happens is that, well, 
when you are going from uh, the pixel representation to uh, the uh, vector representation, you may also lose uh, precision because, well, the, the pixels, you know where they are and uh, who knows how uh, your red line, how the vector uh, data that uh, you represent your pixel data with, how it goes. I mean, it really depends on uh, how you fit, where you fit, what you fit in and uh, so on. So the, the question of conversion between the two data formats is far from being solved or at least not necessarily solved uniquely, but nevertheless, we will look into a couple of ways of going between uh, the vector and raster data back and forth. So first example here on the left uh, is the so-called Dresdenham algorithm. Uh, this is the algorithm for going from the vector data to uh, the raster data to the pixels. Uh, it uh, works uh, segment by segment. So you take this red segment, which uh, right now represents the um, well, so, uh, some data in the vector format and uh, try to represent this red segment with a sequence of pixels. Uh, so the Bresenham algorithm is a pretty simple algorithm. It looks at uh, the pixels through which the red line uh, passes and uh, it actually works slightly differently depending on what slope uh, the red line has, whether it goes like this, like this, like this or like this, it's a directed line. And uh, we will only look at this particular case when it has small slope, slope less than one, and the line is in the first quadrant. So it's in this north, whatever, east or west, not east quadrant. So if the line goes like this, like we have here at the bottom, okay, it goes uh, through the grid. So which pixels would represent uh, the line in the grid? Well, the starting pixel is uh, what it is and the ending pixel is uh, what it is. It's where the segment starts and ends. And then every time when you go to the right, you look at uh, the pixel centers, one above and one at the same height as uh, the previous point was. And uh, you look at this point on the line and checking whether it is closer to this pixel center or to this pixel center. So a very simple uh, algorithm. You kind of look at the middle of the pixels. You see where this middle intersects the segment, the, the given line, the red thing. And uh, you either hit this pixel or this pixel, depending on which is closer. And uh, in our case, of course, this pixel center is closer. So you're saying that, well, this will be the next pixel that represents this line. This is the first, this is the next, and so on. So you continue, you move to the next vertical line. You look at the two pixel centers, this one and this one. This is closer. So here is the pixel, the next pixel that represents this line. And you continue. Here again, you move. Well, I don't know how precise I was here, but assume that this thing is closer than that. So this pixel is hit. Then again, you move to the next uh, half pixel and you see that now, well, this point is closer to this pixel center, so you're hitting up this pixel and so on and so on and so forth. So this is the present home algorithm, pretty simple, converts uh, a linear feature into uh, a set of pixels. That's pretty standard. It, uh, there is a procedure uh, present harm in MATLAB, I guess, and probably in other uh, languages too. So one simple way to convert uh, raster data to, uh, so, sorry, vector data to raster data. Simple because in general, conversion of uh, vectors to raster data is well, conceptually simple. Now, uh, the conversion in the other way uh, we are given all these blue pixels and let's say we want to represent them with a single line. And what would be the best line? Well, one possible uh, way to find the best line or to define the best line is to do the regression. So, uh, you know, you look at the pixel centers that gives you a set of points 
I'll just put some points here in the, well, those suppo were supposed to be points, whatever. You, you have some data, you have some points, and uh, you want to find the line that uh, goes through these points, minimizing some kind of the error. And uh, one common uh, error to minimize is the so-called sum of squared errors. I guess you have seen things like this. It's called the regression. So at every point, you look at the distance between the point and the line, well, the, ver the vertical distance between the point and the line, and you take in the squares of those things, and you try to minimize the sum of squares. So sum of squared deviations. Okay, and uh, I hope you've seen how to do regression. If not, well, <laughs> uh, here it is. So if your line is given by the equation y is equal ax plus b, then uh, here is the sum of squared errors. You take the derivative with respect to b, uh, well, set it to zero, and this is your b. You take the derivative with respect to a, set it to zero, and this gives you a. So you substitute a from here. Sorry, uh, you substitute b from here to here. You get an equation in a only. Here is the solution of the equation. And uh, well, then you substitute the obtained value of a into here. And here is your answer for b. I hope you have seen these formulas uh, when you were doing regression. If not, well, here they are. One particular uh, simple way to do the regression and to um, understand what uh, the coefficients a and b are in the optimal regression line is to move uh, the origin to the center of mass. So assume that the, the average y and average x are equal to zero. And then these formulas simplify a lot because these uh, become equal to zero. And in particular, then you're looking at the line going through the origin. So your b is equal to zero, and you only have a simple formula for a. But anyway, I won't go into the details because I hope that you have seen it in uh, statistics or linear algebra course. If not, uh, well, I'm not really teaching linear regression in GIS course. Uh, and here is something new that you might not have seen and uh, something that I do want to uh, stop for uh, some time, and we'll probably go to uh, the gem board soon, is uh, trying to find the line again that fits through a given set of points, but not really doing the regression. Uh, instead, trying to minimize the square distance from the line to the given points. So, so I'm resuming the recording and repeating that, that right now there is only one point in uh, the data set that delivers the maximum. It's this point. And uh, I can decrease the distance to that point by, well, yeah, moving the line in this direction. Because then, uh, well, this distance will decrease. And I can do that until, so if I start moving the, my line, then this whole slab these three lines, this slab, it will move over here. And I can do it until I'm hitting another point on the other side uh, of, of this slab. So if I were to redraw, I'm not trying to do it exactly in the good, in, in, in the same way at the same points as before. But uh, what I want to say is that, yes, my optimal line should be kind of locked by two points, right? So if I'm looking at this slab, then my line will be exactly in the middle of this slab and I should have two points, two original points on each side of this slab. Then I will be, uh, well, hopefully in the optimum. So essentially, what I'm trying to find is I'm trying to find the minimum width of the point set. So I have my blue point set. And uh, if I look at any direction, uh, 
maybe a direction like this, then what is the width of the minimum slab which contains, uh, uh, fully contains all my points and uh, the slab is perpendicular to this direction? Well, here it is. Maybe I take another direction. I don't know, maybe I take direction like this and I'm trying to find the minimum width slab perpendicular to this direction. I guess it would be something like this that contains all my point, all my points, all the blue points, right? So as I'm rotating the direction, I'm saying if my slab is going to be perpendicular or if my line is going to be perpendicular to this direction, then I'm taking a line like that and then moving it until it hits the point. And I'm taking another line at infinity, again in this direction, and I'm moving it until it hits my point set. And this will be the width of my point set in this direction. And what I really want to find is the direction in which the width of the point set is as small as possible. So maybe in this particular case, maybe this is the answer. But the point is that the uh, slab should contain two original points on the boundary of, uh, of the minimum width slab. And in general, uh, the way to find the uh, line that minimizes the maximum distance uh, to, to the points is uh, to find the minimum width slab that uh, contains your point set, or in other words, find the width of the point set. And I'm not gonna go into the algorithms of um, how you can do that. Uh, if you want, you can read about that, but uh, this is the general idea. So if you want to minimize the maximum, uh, sorry, I'm saying here, min max, what I really meant is <laughs> min max, if I want to minimize the maximum, I'll, I'll make the correction, hopefully. Um, right, so if I want to minimize the maximum, I have to be locked from uh, two sides. So I have to find the width of the uh, point set. Okay, uh, one uh, last measure that uh, of goodness of fit of a line is, uh, well, the minimizing the sum of the distances. So here we're minimizing the sum of squares. If you minimize the sum, then, uh, well, on one hand, things are a bit more complicated that, than here because you don't have, you know, a single solution which would, you know, just take your points and uh, put them in. But uh, on the other hand, you have a simpler algorithm for finding the line that minimizes the sum of distances. So um, again, I'll draw on the gem board and go to the next page seven for that. So what you have here is again a point cloud and you want to find the line that minimizes the sum of distances. And uh, how would you do that? Well, one thing you can do is uh, you can write uh, the formula for the sum of distances. It will be the formula like this, except that you will not have the square, right? So you will have uh, the summation of xi cosine phi plus yi sine phi plus d. But of course, depending on which side of the line you are on this or on this, you will have to take this term with plus or with minus. So if you, are on, if you are on one side, then this gives you the distance. If you're on the other side, then minus this gives you the distance. Or in other words, as you move this line parallel to itself back and forth, uh, which is essentially changing D, you, if you starting getting closer to some of the points and getting farther from some other points. Like if you move in this direction, then 
all these points, they become closer to the line. So you are decreasing the distance. And again, if you move in this direction, then all these points are getting farther away from the line. You're increasing the distance. And uh, let me ask you a question. Maybe let me draw an example. So here I have, I don't know, maybe four points over here, maybe three points over here. And then claiming that this is the line that uh, minimizes the sum of distances. Now, but maybe I'll do more points. So I will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points on one side and five points on the other side. Okay, so I'm looking now at this example. Can this line be the optimal line, the sign that minimizes this, uh, the line that minimizes the sum of distances to my given points? And again, I'm encouraging you to uh, give answers either in the chat or uh, by speaking up, and I will pause. So. Uh, if you have different number of points on the different sides uh, of the line, then uh, you will want to move the line into the direction where you have more points because this way you are decreasing more distances. And even if you have the same number of points, uh, you know, like six points here, six points here, it wouldn't hurt to move the line in either of the directions. And what, uh, so what we have just proved is that the optimal line will necessarily pass through one of the points. So I will try to draw a last picture on this page. If necessary, I will move to a different page. So we know that our line necessarily is passing through one of the points. Okay, well, what I drew here is not necessarily the optimal line, but it should be a line like this, or maybe a line like this, maybe a line like this, and so on. So you can try the lines going through all the points. And then the question is only what is the right rotation angle for the line? And uh, I will not write the formulas for you, but you can write the formula. Well, essentially the formula is right here. You have the sum of square distances. Well, you would have to remove the square, so really take formula like this. And uh, you can see that if you rotate the line, that is if you change uh, the angle of the line, then you will necessarily be at the minimum uh, at one of the extreme points when the line passes through two points. Okay. So uh, this gives you the algorithm. If you want to find the line that uh, minimizes the sum of the distances to given points, then you should just try all the lines that go in through two of your points. So you take every pair of your points, draw a line through them, and among those lines, you choose the best. There is no closed form solution, nothing as beautiful as uh, this one, but still there is an algorithm. Okay, so we have three minutes remaining. Of course, I will not start uh, new topic.